So we used soup x to remove ambient RNA from our Surat object to remove ambient RNA from our scanP objects. And we also visualized the effects of soup x on these lung data. All right, so why do we even care about removing ambient RNA? Here's a nice image the creators of Decant X made. We're gonna be using SoupX, but nonetheless, it's the same idea. The RNA that we really care about is the RNA that's inside of a cell, but when these droplets are formed, they're formed in solution, and that solution carries ambient RNA that comes from random cells that were lysed in the solution. So when the cells are lysed within a droplet, the RNA from the cell is sequenced along with this ambient background RNA that you don't want. But luckily, we have droplets that don't have any cells in them, and these are typically filtered out, but the data are still there, and we can use those to calculate a background. For this tutorial, I have five samples that come from mouse lungs. These are the 10x output folders, and within those, there's the outs, and for SoupX to work, we need the filtered feature barcode matrix as well as the raw feature barcode matrix. And it's okay if you have those in the H5 format, either will work. All right, so we're gonna start in R and combine this with Surat. If you just care about ScanP and Python, just skip ahead in the video. We're just gonna go ahead and load in Surat and SoupX. You can install SoupX just like this. And it's not the purpose of this tutorial, but we're gonna do a simple pre-processing on the data just to remove outlier cells. Basically, I'm just reading in the data, adding some QC metrics, and then finding outliers based on those QC metrics, removing them, and then returning the cleaned Surat object. We're basing whether it's an outlier or not based on these median absolute deviations. There isn't a function for that already, so we're just gonna make one. You'll be able to copy and paste this directly from my GitHub. We have those five lung samples. These are just the directory names that the cell ranger output is in, and we're working in that same directory, so it is the path to these directories. And we're just going to use an sapply and pass these directories to that pre-processing function we just made and create a vector of Surat objects. We now have this vector of Surat objects. They haven't been normalized or processed in any ways. We've just removed outlier cells. For soup X to work, we do need to stratify the cells based on cell type or cluster. So we need to add a cluster label to these cells. And for that, I'm just gonna do a function that takes the Surat object and does the basic Surat normalization and clustering. And we're only gonna return that column that gets added from clustering, the Surat clusters column, so that we don't actually modify the original data. I'm gonna make a little helper function and then I'm going to use S apply. So we can look at an individual object within this. And if we look at the metadata, we've just added this soup group on the right, which is just the low vein cluster. So we haven't done anything with soup X yet. We've just done some basic pre processing and added a group. Now we're actually going to make a make soup function, which will return a Surat object with the ambient RNA removed. So we're passing a Surat object from our list. We're getting the sample ID again, which is just going to be that long label we added earlier. In this case, I'm going to use it again to get the path to that directory because now we have to load in that raw feature barcode matrix. So I'm creating a path to that raw matrix and we're going to load it in. We don't need to create a Surat object from it. We can just use the matrix. We're going to create our soup channel and call it SC and we have to pass this raw matrix that we just loaded in, and we have to pass the counts matrix from our Surat object, which is under assays RNA counts. And then we set the clusters based on that soup group column. We then estimate the contamination of our soup channel, setting plot to false, because I'm doing this on multiple samples at once. I don't wanna clutter my screen with all those different plots. And then from our soup channel, we'll get the adjusted counts matrix, which we'll call out and we'll round it to the nearest end for each value. So if you wanted to, you could keep the original counts as a new assay, but we'll do it just so we can compare afterwards. We actually need to update our RNA counts with our soup corrected matrix. And then we'll just return this modified Surat object. And then we can apply this to our list of data. 
we could just do it on one sample by using the function directly and then passing our Serrat object. But usually you have more than one sample, so I like S apply. So let's just go ahead and run that. Basically ignore them. Especially I don't know why it doesn't like me using original counts. It says that it's saved to something else, but it's not. It's still original counts. Anyways, let's take a very superficial look at what actually happened. We can look at that original counts assay that we made. And I'm just looking at the first sample here, lung one. And here's the sum of all the UMI in that object. If we look at the default RNA assay, which we put as the soup X output, we can see that it has a decreased number of UMI. So we got rid of around 2% of the total RNA. I'm not going to do any plotting of different genes and stuff now. I will do it at the end of the Python section of this video. So I recommend fast forwarding to that, even if you don't care about implementing this in Python. I just wanted to point out here that some of my code is a modified version of what's given in the single cell best practices from the Tice lab, not just for correction with SoupX, but they have a lot of different things. This is a great resource for all aspects of single cell sequencing. I'm going to load in our modules. And again, this will be on GitHub. You can just copy and paste from it. We're basically going to do the same exact thing. We just did an R for the pre-processing. And the pre-processing is independent of the actual SoupX correction, but it's good practice. So I'm just going to read in the data based on its sample ID, which corresponds to the directory, calculate QC metrics. And then I'm going to filter out outliers again based on the MAD or the median absolute deviations, and then return this filtered A data object. So I have the sample IDs or directory names of the 10x output. And then I'll just make a list of A-data objects that I'm going to call A-datas and pass that pre-processing function. All right, so here are where things start to get a little different. SoupX is an R, so we need to import a couple of things so that we can go between Python and R. So we need this and data 2 ri and we need RPY2. And RPY2 allows us to do this R magic or run R code directly from our Jupyter Notebook here. Importantly, you need to have R installed on your system and you need to have SoupX installed within your R environment as well. So we're going to load those in. I already have them installed. So now we need a git soup group. We have to add a latent cluster because SoupX works better with self clusters, but we don't want to modify the original A data. So I'm taking a copy and I'm just returning a vector of laden labels and calling it soup X groups in the observation data. We actually have to break the A data down into its constituent components. So I have this prepare raw function, which we're passing A data. I'm just getting a vector or a list of the cell names, a list of the gene names, and the raw data, which needs to be transposed. We need to load in the raw feature barcode matrix, and I'm just using the sample ID, which we added in the pre-processing function, which is just going to be something like lung one. So I'm reading in that raw matrix, just getting the values and again, transposing it. The last component of the broth is the soup group, which I just described above. I'm just getting a vector of that soup group labels, and then I'm passing all of this to the output. So again, prepare broth just breaks it into these individual components. And then we need to actually use our R magic to make a function in R that we can run here. So this is going to be an R cell. All the code in this cell is going to be run in R. We're going to load in supex. We're going to make a function within R called make soup, and it's going to take these individual components from our broth function as input into it. Since they're in individual components, we kind of have to build them back up into a cell by gene matrix that it wants to see. So we're adding the genes and the cells onto the data matrix. We're making sure it's the right format. This is going to be similar to what we did in R, but a little bit different. So we're going to spawn the soup channel, but we're going to ask false for calculate soup profile. We're going to make the soup profile ourselves. We're going to set that soup profile. And then the rest is going to be identical. We're going to pass the soup groups, estimate the contamination, get the adjusted counts matrix as out, and then return out. So we have our R code set up. Now we're just going to make a little helper function called cook soup. We're going to get those individual broth ingredients from the prepare broth function we made earlier. And then using R magic, we're going to pass those Python variables into R using these I flags. 
and then we're telling it with this O flag that we're going to get out and we're going to bring that back into Python. And in that same line, I'm going to put out as equal to the make soup function that we just defined above in R. And of course, pass these input variables here. And then once we have out back in Python, we're just going to update the A data object. We're going to save the raw counts as a layer. We're going to make a new soup x counts layer. And we're getting that from the out variable. And we have to transpose it again. And we're going to set the default x matrix as the soup counts and then just return a data. Now we can cook soup for every a data in our list, and we're just going to let that simmer for a little while. All right, that finished. So let's take a quick taste and see if it's done cooking. So it looks like we got rid of around three and a half percent of the reads, at least from this one a data object. So let's go ahead and graph this and see what it looks like on an individual gene level. All right, so I have those five different samples. So I'm going to just do a quick integration using Scannerama. I'm not going to mess with the raw A data. Instead, I'm going to make a new A data list. So I'm passing a copy from the A data's list. And then I'm going to integrate with Scannerama. And then I'm going to extract these Scannerama embeddings from each of the objects in the normalized integrated A datas. We're going to go ahead and concatenate all of our unnormalized A datas. And then after we concatenate it, we're going to add those embeddings we extracted. And then just for visualization purposes, we're going to calculate neighbors and then the UMAP. And we make sure for the neighbors, we have to specify that it's this X Scannerama slot. All right, once that's done, we're going to create a before and after matrix. That's just a binarized matrix to show if a cell is positive or negative for a given gene. We're going to subtract the after matrix from the before. Any value that's one after subtraction means that a cell was positive before for a gene, and then after correction, it was negative for a gene. And then we're just making one final binarized matrix called changed, which is just if it went from being positive to negative. And then I'm going to add a new column in the A data var, which is just the sum across the genes. Sorry, I didn't actually save changed to the layers, but we can just change that here. So if we look at the A data var, we now know for a given gene, how many cells that were positive for that gene were then negative for that gene after supex. So let's just sort this. So we have some of these genes, which were removed from a lot of cells. You know, right off the bat, I can see that some of these are macrophage and other myeloid markers. So there were likely cells that were positive for these genes only because some myeloid cell was lysed and that RNA ended up in a droplet from something like an endothelial cell. And then one last thing I'm going to do is just normalize the A data X so that we can plot it. And let's just take CD74 and CHILL3. So if we look at the log normalized expression, we do see that these clusters are expressing these genes at high levels. But what if we look at the binarized expression? So it is, and I'm setting the Vmax here as one, and I'm using the raw counts layer. So we can see that a vast majority of the cells are positive for both CD74 and CHILL3 before we did the soup X. But instead, let's use the soup X counts layer. And again, is it positive or negative? And we see a very big difference. You see that some of these clusters that had many cells positive for these genes now have almost no cells positive for those genes. So we used soup X to remove ambient RNA from our Surat object in R. We used it to remove ambient RNA from our scanP objects, and we also visualized the effects of SUPX on these lung data.